I'd firstly like to say that none of the points I will be discussing are actual descriptions of communism, not by a long shot. Instead, they are myths that I've heard throughout my lifetime, whether it be from horribly misinformed teachers or straight up anti-communist propaganda. With that said, I'd also like to make the disclaimer that I'm not using these straw man arguments against communism as a way to argue for communism. Instead, I use them purely to make a point about how America, and more specifically, capitalist countries, use communist countries or communism in general as something to project their problems onto. Basically put, capitalism uses projection as a defense mechanism instead of acknowledging and fixing its problems. Through this defense mechanism, capitalism will attach its problems to other economic systems, even though those problems are inherent to their system and not the one they are projecting on. Here are eight different problems that America has projected onto communism. Or, if I wanted to word this in a way that got me more views, I'd probably say something along the lines of eight reasons why America is textbook communism. The Communist Party owns most of the wealth. While not as extreme in capitalism, it too has a small group of people that owns most of the wealth, the capitalist class. According to data from the Federal Reserve, the top 1% in America owns around 40% of the overall wealth. The government owns all enterprise, or no entrepreneurship. Simply replace government with conglomerates and monopolies, and you have what already happens in capitalist countries like America. Putting aside the fact that the average business startup cost is around about $30,000, which is more than what most working class people can afford, there really isn't much entrepreneurial freedom in capitalist countries either. Conglomerates and monopolies make it harder for someone to start their own business, let alone compete by becoming an entrepreneur. For example, internet service providers like Comcast have formed monopolies so that they can own most of the market, and have gone as far as to lobby Congress to make it illegal for someone to make their own ISP in an area where there's already internet access. Simply put, it is within the interests of the ruling capitalist class to make it harder for competition to harm their bottom line. You can't choose the job you want. A job is forced on you. When I was younger, this problem in communist countries was described with a little story. Let's say that John was a strong man in a communist society, and he wanted to be a baker. Well, because he was strong, he was instead forced to work in the mines. If only he would have been in a capitalist country, then he could have chosen his job instead, right? Well, not exactly. Pro-capitalist organizations like Prager U preach that you shouldn't choose your dream job in the first place, and while you can technically choose the job you want, there are stipulations. Are you gay or part of the LGBTQ community? then you might want to avoid these 29 states that can legally fire you based on that part of your identity alone. Don't have the money to afford college? According to Georgetown University, that takes over 42% of all jobs off the table for you. Are you an Asian, African American, or other racial minority? Then your chances of being hired are also stifled unless you whiten your resume, according to a study from the Harvard Business School. Or maybe you took the advice of the capitalists and went into a STEM field. Congratulations! Unless you're a woman. Then your chances of getting hired into a job requiring intellectual ability, such as STEM jobs, is actually less for you when compared to males. I think you get my point. We have career freedom, but with a big heaping asterisk that we are shy to talk about. Even if we didn't have these stipulations, this so-called career freedom still hasn't kept 68% of employees from being disengaged with their work. What's really funny is that the article talking about this problem suggests that scientific studies would say that not alienating your workers helps them become more engaged. Shocker. Communism starves people. Or there's breadlines. While I could simply go for the cheap shot here and just say that America also had breadlines during the Great Depression, that's boring and a cliche counterargument. Capitalism has this problem too, and according to multiple sources from this infographic, capitalism kills 6.7 million people a year from hunger alone. Clearly, starvation is not a problem exclusive to communism as one would assume. Communism relies on state violence. So does capitalism. Someone critical of capitalism would argue that one of the main purposes of the law is to work within capitalist interests. This is done through the state's protection of their interests, such as private property, but also the large disparity between punishments for working class crimes and corporate crimes. Many people's lives are ruined over simple things such as drug charges and are sometimes in prisons that have incentives to keep them there, which makes it harder for them to reintegrate into society since they've been out for so long. Meanwhile, during the 2008 economic crisis, the only country to jail the bankers who are responsible for such idiotic handling of finances was Finland. In other countries, instead of being penalized for these crimes, they were instead paid through bailouts going off of the motto of, too big to fail. Even when a company is punished for their wrongdoing, it is not enough for them to reconsider their actions. Take pharmaceutical companies who are responsible for the opioid crisis. 
While America is still looking into this issue, these companies aren't taking legal action seriously. To sum up what John Oliver covers in his second opioid crisis video, these companies make so much money from writing millions of prescriptions that legal fees are too insignificant for it to hurt their revenues. At the end of the day, they see it as a small fine and a dumb court date, while everyone else sees it as negligent behavior in the pursuit of profit. Communist countries are run by one party. This one's a bit of a stretch, I'll admit, but I'm going to make the case for both major political parties in America as being basically the same party. Do they differ on some issues here and there? Yeah, but at the end of the day, they suffer what I like to call the tug of war effect. What happens with these parties is that they are both tugging on a rope, with centrists in the middle. If the conservatives become more extreme, they tug on this rope tighter which pulls centrists and liberals their way. This forces the Democrat party to use poor strategies that try to win over conservatives instead of liberals through fancy words like compromises, which really just means that they are appeasing the other party on an issue for likeness among voters with a more conservative bias. Same thing happens in countries where liberals tug the rope tighter as well. Self-identified conservatives in these countries tend to support more liberal policies because their end of the rope is being pulled further towards the left. But at the end of the day, both of these parties will always support the establishment, and regardless of party affiliation, will vote on subjects that the middle class would never agree with, such as large and unnecessary expansions to the military budget. When push comes to shove, they will always lick America's boot. Communist countries have a lack of choices in the market. The only reason we believe we have a choice in capitalism is because we're given the illusion of choice. Remember that ISP monopoly I mentioned earlier? That's not the only monopoly that's limiting your choices and jacking prices up. There's also a Luxottica monopoly on eyewear. There is a monopoly on insulin since three companies control 90% of that market. There's a media monopoly as well with only six companies controlling 90% of the media. There are even a lot of common store items under different names that are made by the same brand. And if all of that isn't enough to show you that we have an illusion of choice in America, the Open Market Institute has an extensive list of monopolized industries on their website as well. Communist countries use propaganda to force national pride. If this wasn't true, I wouldn't be making this video. America projects its capitalist problems onto communism because it cannot be bothered with any skepticism that might ruin their image. We as Americans have very little to be proud of, and are behind most of the developed world. I'm sure I'm not the first person to tell you that we do not rank highly in anything good. While these are only myths about communism, you can learn more about what real communism is by checking out my What Actually Is Socialism Slash Communism video in the description below.